Yeah. All right. Welcome to the uh, inaugural edition of the Justin Bruckman Adventure. I'm Justin Bruckman. This is my uh, my uh, producer slash co-host Josh and Josh, yeah. our very first guest today, the master of reinvention, is Robin Black. This adventure. It's the Justin Bruckman adventure. Adventure. I like it. Yeah. Let's go on one. It's uh, fuck. We're always on one. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's how you ended up here, right? I know. How many it's times true. have we had? We're gonna have the same. Same conversation we've had in a hotel room yeah. at TKO a million times. So. We're not drunk this time. <laughs> I don't drink, so I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I guess like Me to, to start, like to, for the people listening, like tell tell them a little bit about how you how you know each other and like where you guys first met and like how long your relationship has been so far. You guys know each other for a long time, uh, right? Yeah. Y- yes. Uh, my first perspective <laughs> is when I started fighting or preparing to fight in like 2005 or six. I started to research the people that came before me, Justin Bruckman, uh, Claude Patrick, Sean Pearson, Adrian Woolley, and I wanted to know everything about these guys. I don't even remember the first time I actually met you. I, I remember the first yeah. time I met you. Yeah. No, no, well, it was yeah. good. I met you at the jiu-jitsu yeah. tournament, and you were, you, were, you were with Kareem, right? Yeah, Kareem. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where you started with those yep. guys? Yeah. yeah, up at uh, Toronto BJJ. Kareem, oh, what was the name of... Uh, the uh, jiu-jitsu coach before him, he had come from Brazil. Uh, and Wagney. He, no, yeah. after him. Wagney uh, taught Kareem, gave Kareem his black belt. Right, yeah. It was Cesar. Right, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I was training with him. He departed shortly after, and Kareem became my coach, and yeah. Kareem gave me my blue belt. Yeah, so yeah. I remember, remember he introduced, I can't remember what tournament we were at, and uh, he's like, oh, this is, my, this is our friend Robin, blah, blah, and I was like, I, was like, I fucking know that guy from somewhere. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't put it together, and then I... Yeah. In the math, yeah, you that would have been two thousand six. Yeah, so yeah, I was already I was already finished when you were just starting to get going twelve so, years ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yeah, I remember that. I remember you had a you had a hard you had a rough start. Yeah, breaking into that world, right? Because yeah, fuck. Wow, but, yeah, but back then it, it was. Um, we were very very protective back then, mm-hmm. right? Now everyone and their mom watches it and is competing and whatever yeah. else. And for you to come from your background in music and whatever else, like especially yeah. glam rock too, yeah. right? Yeah. So, no, it, yeah. The, anywhere yeah. you go after glam rock yeah. can be tough. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, when, when you wear eye makeup and you stick your hair out really big and you wear tight leather pants, that's in, in this era, that's there for life. Like, mm. so you better be sure that you take some amount of pride in, in performing. Yeah. Because if you ever had a pink mohawk or you ever wore eye makeup or you ever did those things, you better be able to be proud of them. And I am. I, I'm very proud that I was wore costumes and put on f- like theatrical performances. But yeah, when you decide you want to go fight people yeah. and you want, and it was kind of important to me to, to eventually belong. Yeah. But I also understood that it would be quite normal for people to go, who the fuck is this guy? Well, He's yeah. sort of not welcome. Well, you're, you're a tourist, right? Mm-hmm. That's what everyone thought of you at yeah. first, right? And they're like, oh, it's fucking their gimmick or whatever mm-hmm. else is it happens yeah yeah it's the way it goes right it still it's, happens it's, yeah for sure and even but back then we there was so few of us that everyone was yeah. very very protective because let's say anyone can walk into a gym now and mm-hmm. start to train and maybe compete whatever but back then they were like we were we were freaks of nature you know what i mean there's only there's so so few of us and and you knew everyone too. So like people are really like, oh, my friend does uh, cage fighting. I'm like, right, right, right off <laughs> yeah. the bat, I'm going to shake my head. But yeah. if you did MMA, I knew who you were in Canada. Yeah. And you knew who I was because there was only like, you know, 50 of us. Yeah. You know, that's it. And that's why it was so interesting to me. And that's why the history of it was kind of important to me. Um, because there'd be like a Joe Dirksen in Winnipeg. And then, yeah. you know, in Edmonton, there would be maybe Tim Haig wasn't even fighting. I don't know no, who no, kind of would have been. Uh, there was a few bigger guys out in Edmonton. There yeah. was some guys out in uh, Surrey, BC. You know, yeah. there was people out on the East Coast. But you did know each other. And I was able to kind of figure out who was who and where they acquired that knowledge. Because yeah. that was... I found that really interesting. Mm -hmm. Dirksen would talk to me when I got to know him about how they would drive like 14 hours because they heard there was a purple belt somewhere in the States. Yeah, crazy, right? You guys would do that, right? Yeah, all the time. Well, we had our, we had uh, Silvio Baring. He'd come from Brazil every year and spend months with us at a time. Mm -hmm. That's how we learned, right? Mm -hmm. But when I got my black belt, I was in the, I was in the first 10 or something like that in in, in Canada. Now it's like there's hundreds. Yeah, there's hundreds and hundreds. Like around in Durham region, there's 20, you know what I mean? So, wow. I remember about when I was, you know, still really kind of pulling in that research and six, maybe even eight years ago, I remember the hundredth. Yeah. And now there's probably six or eight or nine. Yeah. Well, those guys all, yeah, yeah, they all grew up and I've, I've uh, promoted a few myself now. Right. Yeah. And that's what happens. It it, uh, it just builds and builds. Right. But that the scary part about jujitsu is like, if you watch uh, karate in the sixties, 
Taekwondo in the 80s, you were a Taekwondo kid too, weren't you? Like the the original karate and the original Taekwondo, those guys were badasses. Mm -hmm. And then people started selling it or it became a sport and whatever else. And it gets watered down. Now the same thing with Jiu Jitsu is like, you can buy, you can buy, not for me, but you can fucking buy a belt. (laughs) But it's rare still or rare-ish still. Like you haven't been in the room with a lot of total bullshit black belts, have you? Uh, I've had one come through here. Yeah. You should read my Google review. So you know who it is. I, I will. Because we fuck that guy up. Wow. So, but um, yeah, you know what? It's some, you can't lie about it because the mats don't. The mats yeah. will tell the truth really yeah. fast, right? But at the same time, like my version, of, I learned jujitsu to do MMA, mm-hmm. right? Now guys are doing jujit, learning jujitsu, not even for MMA, not for self defense. They're mm-hmm. doing jujitsu to go compete in jujitsu. Yeah, that's where it's changed so much, right? So like I see these guys that are just they're incredible in jujitsu, but I'm like in a real fight they're gonna die yeah. because of the techniques they 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 learn or only you can only apply it to competitive jiu-jitsu they still they still don't have basic self-defense when um so I, now i get to commentate all these different kinds of martial arts which is super cool and um most of them to some degree will fail in a fighting environment 100 percent. that's why it's mixed martial arts you got to know everything <laughs> yeah right you can't go box you can't yeah. go wrestle you better have all your shit together yeah. you can be stronger in one point but you can't just walk in is, there's weaknesses in any belief system, right? Um, and I now I'm kind of on this trip to, uh, talking about martial arts and anything in life where almost nothing's actually a real thing. Like there's not really a such thing as karate. It's just a bunch of beliefs people had that then they passed along. Yeah. T- uh, jiu-jitsu to a certain degree, there's really no such thing as jiu-jitsu. It's a bunch of choices and doctrines and beliefs that were collected, tried, experimented, and it's based on a whole bunch of beliefs. There's no real such thing as conservative or liberal. It's a whole bunch of beliefs and concepts that people pulled together and stood by. Do you know what I mean? I've got a fucking clue what you're saying, but <laughs> I respect it. Yeah. <laughs> to, to some degree, everything is... No, I, go, ju- I know you, what you, mean. You know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. But, and that's the, uh, you know, the sign of a good martial art is uh, that it's progressive as well, right? Yeah. Where it's a lot of problems with the traditional martial arts is they don't accept anything new right right yeah. jiu-jitsu is like the biggest greediest martial art where they just see they're like see something work in wrestling or see something work in judo and they just take it and they're like oh no this is jiu-jitsu yeah right, right. so yeah that's 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 yeah but yeah like you gotta you gotta go into everything you do with an old mind right it, like if you just narrow yourself down you're gonna be limited and, and that's martial arts or any other yeah. area as well right so studying martial arts kind of helps you study anything yeah you know but i think training hard at anything that is kind of progressive and knowledge is built on knowledge does that yeah like if you you know are a gymnast or a climber or a piano player studying it long enough will help you learn how to learn shit and help you learn how to kind of assess the world around you you know what the with martial arts especially jiu-jitsu and and and, uh like the grappling arts you know i mean Mm because i think the hardest is wrestling and judo and jiu-jitsu right but um uh, they, they teach you to overcome adversity like mm-hmm. every single day, every moment of every match, you got to figure something out. Right. That's why you, I tell people all the time, wrestling is the hardest martial art there is. It's wrestling is terrifying and, and grueling and there's no professional, nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. There's no professional level and you're just getting leaned on all the time. But if you can learn how to wrestle at a young age, like there's not going to be anything harder in your life. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's why I like the, I like putting the kids in tough martial arts because it'll make, yeah, your, the rest of your life is easy as shit after mm-hmm. that. Like you've, you've learned how to fight battles every single day and just dust yourself off and get back to it. Right. The, um, there's rest in most things that you do that are hard. Mm-hmm. You can find a place to rest. It's very hard to rest when somebody's wrestling you. Yeah. Like th- there's nowhere to really go. And that's, that's how the best guys win. Is they're the best grinders, yeah. right? They're great athletes, but they mentally and physically they're just tougher, right? And they'll lean on you until someone until until someone breaks, or they just break you more than you break them before the time has elapsed. You know what I mean? Like that's that yeah. said. There's always forward motion, always a head bunt, always someone pulling on yeah. your neck. Like it's the worst sport in the world. Yeah, it's terrible. And and that's why there's no you very few wrestling clubs. Right. You can walk into a jiu-jitsu gym, karate gym, okay. kickboxing gym because you can hit pads all day. You can roll with your friends. Yeah. Right, you go to wrestling is awful. Yeah, and that's so so no one wants no one wants to pay for it. Let alone like no one even wants to do it. Let alone yeah. pay for it. You know. So when, uh, me and Ram Dean and and Pollock and a few of our friends went over to Russia and we were commentating like eighteen different martial arts. Oh, yeah. the, the yeah. world combat, the world combat the, yeah. games. Yeah, it was like 
It's got to be for maybe five years ago now, but it was one of the greatest adventures I've ever been on because Russia's crazy to begin with. It's amazing, an amazing place. And they all kind of think like wrestlers in yeah. Russia, right? Yeah, the yeah. whole world does the way they, the way they drive their cars, everything. It's beautiful. And, and, um, we, every day, a different martial art wrapped and then they would give out their winners and their, yeah. you know, whatever. And then they would party that night. So one night it's the sumos and that was Obviously the craziest yeah, no doubt. thing you've ever seen. And then another night there would be like kendo players. And, uh, you know, they were very smart and, and conversational. When the wrestlers rapped, it was just really rude and harsh because they all look very alpha. They don't have any necks. And they just start getting re ruined really early and then kind of pushing into each other. Like the whole vibe of the celebration of all the, wor the world-class wrestlers was completely different than all the other martial yeah, arts. Yeah, you for know? sure. Just a lot of alpha men. That, that's, that's, that's how you become that good. You have to be like, yeah, man. All my, all my friends who wrestled are successful because, uh, yeah, like you look at a guy yeah. like Wooly, who's, I yeah. think he's, he, now he's, he's in charge of the Peel uh, Police yeah, the Union. union. Yeah. Like, he's like, I want that fucking job. And he put his <laughs> little, tiny little neck down and just went mm -hmm. for it. And Pearson's is highly successful yeah. in everything he's done. All my wrestling friends, like if you had, because you, you also, have to, in Canada, especially like, well, in the States too, if you had, in order to wrestle to a high level, you had to go th through the collegiate system anyway yeah. so you had to stay in school so these guys grind and they knew if you grind it out someone else is going to pay for your school too right so they got the education they got the know-how you know and, I mean? and you and i are both going to try to grind it out to get yeah. our education yeah. paid for but only one of us is going to get yeah. it and so but that's it too right yeah. like the, so they're actually even even at a competitive level at the university in, in canada you need to stay carded if you're losing you're not going to get carded next year Insane. you got so they're out there to fuck each other up right well uh, you're you're a father um I'm not yet, but I, uh, that'll be in my future, I, I hope. Um, Faraz Sahabi was talking about how his sons, they have to wrestle. They just, they have to, young. That was, my, that was my theory, yeah. yeah. But, and uh, did, you, did your kids know? <laughs> no, my, uh, my son did jiu-jitsu for like a couple of years, and one day he's just like, I don't like jiu-jitsu, Dad. I'm like, eh, yeah, that and, sucks, but all right. And, and that's an interesting thought, too. It's like, you don't want to be that dick either. Like, if, if you're, you know, my wife is a singer. If her parents made her do wrestling instead of singing, what would her life look yeah, like? Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, my I don't care. My son plays basketball like a lot, like four or five days a week. As long as you're active and you learn how to work hard and function like within a sport, which I think yeah. is huge because it it's all your friends for life come from your mm -hmm. sports mm -hmm. and teaches you how to work as a team and, and work ethic and, and you're getting exercise. I, I don't care. Like. I didn't want, I, I would never want my son to take the same path I did in life anyway. Nah. Like this martial arts thing, man, it's hard as shit. Like you wake up, I'm, you never get paid what you're worth. You're always injured. Like, yeah. So I'm, and I never, I don't have an education. I'm like, I want him to have options, whether it's to go to school or get a trade or whatever. I don't want you to have to do this. When I was, when I was done fighting, I didn't have a choice. This is what I had to do. Yeah. I'm just fortunate it worked out. Cause like, and you I like no, teaching people yeah, now. Right? Yeah, no, for yeah. sure. Most of the time. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I don't. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, I have the best job in the world, but there's still days I'm like, fuck this job. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And anyone can say that. Like even porn stars have a bad day at the office, right? And all they do is fuck. I, so. I would think actually doing too much. I, if I have too much ice cream, I don't like ice cream anymore. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, but, it's a, people think, so people think when they see somebody that they think is successful, they think it's that their life is great. Everything's easy or something, but it's hard for fucking everybody. Like if you're doing, people are like, oh, I wish I was doing the thing that I'd love to do. It's still really hard. Yeah. Like life and accomplishing anything is extraordinarily hard and the world is very unforgiving. And that's yeah. just the truth. The, you know, the truth is, is if you see someone that loves their job, they probably kicked like they kicked ass a hundred times harder than you did just to get there you know what i mean yeah. and then once i got there it was still hard oh man yeah. well people only see the couple out they see you while you're on stage yeah. or on you're on t on camera or whatever yeah. so they see me for the three four hours i'm on the mats every day and they think it's easy i'm like what the fuck did you think i did for the last eight hours to yeah. get ready for this right for sure. and i've been doing that for I've had my gym since 2004 and I only hired a gym manager a year ago. Wow. And, Jeez. and the best thing every day, cause she makes my job so much less stressful and she's fucking awesome at it and she loves it. So it makes my, and I, like, I like walking into work every day and I'm like, cause I seen her cause I know she's got it handled and my job's easy <laughs> yeah, and that's it's awesome. been the best thing I did. But I'm like, I didn't now I'm at the point I'm like, I don't know how the fuck I did it. I sucked yeah. at it. I wasn't making nearly as much money and like, and it just stressed me out. You know, like you got to deal with the shit you hate all day just to deal with, just to go do the things you love. 
love. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I guess that's, yeah. I that's, guess that's everything. everyone's life, right? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And there's different ways to choose to do it. There are times, I'm sure you think this, and it crosses my mind sometimes too, where I'm like, you know, if I had become a mail carrier or something that was like, like a construct of a job yeah. where I could work 30 hours a week, do it, you know, give a good effort and like do a good job and be, and be clear of it and then do the stuff I want for fun 30 hours a week. On some level, that would maybe be more freeing than working 60 hours well, a week really hard on the thing that I love. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, it's, it would be nice to show up every Thursday and know what you're getting paid. <laughs> that true. takes a lot of the yeah. stress yeah, off yeah. too, but like most jobs in life, by the time yeah. you're done your day at work, you don't get to do, do the things you want. Yeah. But whether it's like you're too tired or you have other responsibilities mm-hmm. with family and whatever, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's being an entrepreneur or in business for yourself, whatever, it's always hard, but people never see that part. They just see when you start to become a little bit successful. And even that level of success, is isn't nearly what people think it is you know what i mean like just because you're on television doesn't mean you're making money like yeah probably you probably went broke trying to get there the Mm -hmm. man like so commentating fighting is the thing that i love to do and ram dean is one of the john ram dean is the guy i love to do it most with but i do it with some different people all the time and when he and i sit down finally and we're sitting there and people are about to fight. It's the greatest fucking Hell thing yeah, in the world. Yeah. It's the greatest thing ever. It's the 65 hours that it took to kind of get to that spot. And then the 10 years of trial and error and learning that's made you able to do that. But that part is incredible. Um, but when you have to book flights or figure out something or uh, I know what I was going to say. I did it for free probably 180 times. Yeah. And I begged for those jobs. Did whatever it took. Somebody wanted to see video or something. I don't know how to edit video. I had to figure out how to edit it, send it to them, badger them, pay my own flight, pay my own way there, and then prepare for 30 hours to do it for free for like seven years, you know, five, six years. You have to do that. Um, And that part, you, although it leads you to something you love, you never get that back. You invest that time. That's time. But you you get better at it because you did that. Yeah, for sure. Um, Ram Deems, the guy we're going to get out here as well. Yeah, I love, fucking love that guy. He's a wonderful human being. Yeah, no, he's he's wicked. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. No one ever sees the hard work you put in, right? And they just assume that you're like you're getting paid a lot and you be and you're successful. And even even if you are making money, it doesn't make you successful. Yeah. You can be a miserable person For with sure. all the money in the world. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So, um, commentating. Do you uh, have you commentated the last couple of TKOs? Uh, the last one I didn't because they didn't air it, but all the ones previous to that. The last one, they're doing these Thursday night ones now, and so far they're not airing those. But yes, the last few. Uh, and I do love them, man. Those are TKO. That, was that where you first fought? It was called... Um, uh, you see, it was see, called, yeah. dude, check out the poster behind you. Yeah. That's the very first poster. Look, wow. at the guy, look at the names on there. Wow. Aaron Riley, Wagney, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dirk, Dirk Wardenberg. <laughs> Chemo. <laughs> Versus Loiseau, L- Steven Yo, Pot Ben. Yeah, he, he, he ended up fighting uh, Elvis Sinisic. Who did? Uh, um, I, no, you know what? It was Dave Benito against Sinisic for the very oh, first. Cool. The, the, both those Jesus. guys bailed off of it. So no, that's UCC1? Yep. Oh, man. Crazy, eh? Yeah. What year is that? Uh, uh, 2000. 2000 yeah. June 2nd, 2000. That's 18 years ago. Yeah. Fuck. Were you scared? <laughs> Oh, it's terrifying, man. It's like, it's scary, funny. Everyone yeah. wants to do it. And, yeah. then, and then all of a sudden the yeah. lights go on and you realize yeah. what you signed up yeah. for. And like, I walked out of there, like, I fought David Lebozo that night. Mm. And he was just getting a kick in the fuck out of me. And then he just made one mistake. Actually, check out that painting. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. There's you on top of Dave. <laughs> that was the beginning and the end for yeah. that guy. But until yeah. that point. You were a black belt at the time? Oh, fuck no. no. I, was in, I think I was still a white belt. Fuck. I was a brown belt in judo and then wow. a white belt. Wow. And it, he made one mistake and I ended up on top and just punched it, his face. Yeah. In. Yeah. And thank God. Cause I fought him again. He fucking yeah. steamrolled me. So did he kick you in the head? Uh, no, no, actually guillotine me, but I was like, he was just yeah. well prepared yeah. for the next yeah. one. Right. So yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think we were both bullies going into the first one and I just, yeah, ended up being, he made a mistake. Right. So Sean Pearson and Adrian Woolley both said to me, so I, I, that's why I found that era so amazing. By the time I fought in 2008, that's still early compared to some people today, yeah. but it was very late compared to this era. And by this point, we kind of knew that what the other guy probably knew. Yeah. You know, we knew kind of, you know, you're a blue belt in jujitsu. Yeah, there was, no, there was yeah. no surprises, no, no secrets. Yeah. Whereas then it's like, fucking, they could have the death touch. Yeah. Like, what if David Loazzo had the death touch? Yeah. You didn't know. Yeah, like, no, you didn't and know. for sure. And, but this, 
that that, that ring and that cage doesn't lie either. You yeah. found out like who could who deserved to be there and who didn't. Mm-hmm. Because the first few there was like kung fu guys and shit, yeah, and right. they, who were just getting steamrolled. Yeah. And back then too, it was like way more obvious that the, that um, UCC was setting up their Quebecers to win than it is right. now. Right now, yeah. they they understand the system and and you can make a star it doesn't mean to have to be out of Quebec, right. even though or, still, or that they necessarily have to win all the time. Yeah, right. yeah. But back then it was just bunch of tough guys and a bunch of tomato cans and then yeah. the tomato wow. cans got pushed aside and the rest of us mm-hmm. kind of moved on so uh you know what um I, I also find now like the the mind of fighting you know and and what you're going through and how you're preparing for it and and so i find that fascinating oh that's what i was going to say with adrian woolley and sean pearson was back then they would say that even before they started thinking about the strategy of fighting, both of them said, and I'm sure this probably all you guys said this because you were part of the same group, that you would look at the situation and go, if you and the other guy were thrown into this room and the door was locked, only you're leaving it. You're going to tear them apart and only you're going to leave it. And you start with that mindset that if neither of you knew anything, you would beat him up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> which I always thought as they explained that to me, I was like, fuck, that's a nice place to start. Like mentally, that's a nice place to start. If we didn't really know anything or it's just who's the the man going to walk out of this, it'll be me. Yeah. Um, but uh, that idea of toughness or confidence, people talk about it a lot. Kids are fighting in the UFC and somebody, oh, that guy was overconfident or he's so confident. I don't think people understand that that's not like an attribute you just have. It's different on different days. You're, you're stronger today than yesterday oh, or you, you're you better. S- than, you s- yeah. yeah you, sorry. You see guys are animals one week and then you see them yeah. again a few months later and they're, then there's, their brain's not in it, whatever. And you yeah. get crushed. But like yeah. for me personally, like, I get more and more mentally tough as I go, got older. Mm-hmm. And especially I watch these younger guys and like who are way more skill and better athletes and better condition. I'm like, I'll still beat you yeah. because I'm willing to do shit that you haven't even fucking thought about yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and take uh, shit that will intimidate them when other guys can't take it and yeah. you can. Yeah. Oh man, having a game face is the biggest thing in the world. Yeah. Like I'm just as get, like these guys I'm training with, they're 20 years younger, but, and I'm way more exhausted than you are, but I'll never tell you. Right. right. And then eventually you just start to weather. And then when I smell that, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to lean on you harder and eventually mm-hmm. you just quit. Right. So for, for me, in retrospect, and I'm a different human now than I was then, and I was different at different stages. Some nights I had it, and some I didn't. And I understand now that in the years since, that that's something that you train, mm-hmm. and that's something you develop. It's a skill, like the ability to be on, or to have your shit together, or to be mentally focused or that, that that was a skill I hadn't really mastered. And you maybe never master it, but you get better and better and oh, better. A hundred percent, like a hundred percent. I uh, just, uh, just fighting in Thailand last year. Like I wish I had that mindset my entire competitive career. Cause mm-hmm. like I, like I take over the years, I've, I've taken pride in breaking guys physically and, and emotionally. Right. And we've gotten better and better at that as I get older. And like to the point where like, I loved I, when I finished my career, I was so fucking tired of training and i was like and because there was no and i had to fight for the money Mm -hmm. so it made it stressful the outcome of my last matchup was irrelevant Mm -hmm. but people were so into it and behind it and whatever else it didn't matter i was it was freeing to just go and fight whether i lost i was still gonna be a fucking superhero when i got home right Mm -hmm. but i knew going i know knew going into that i'm like i got nothing to lose i'm just gonna be throw down be creative and have fun and and because i thought like that going in i'd perform even better right Mm like that's I think a lot of guys crumble too because there's so much rides on it now. Like these guys yeah. throw everything they have into it, and if they, they they lose and they get cut, they really have nothing to go to. So that's that's extra stress on top of what you're already you're going out there to get hit in the face by a brick, right? So yeah, yeah, hit in the face by a brick, thrown or physically hit, um, swung at you by a prof- super fit professional athlete. Yeah, like oh, no, sure. and, and who get better and stronger and faster all the time. Yeah. Like uh, these guys, I'm watching these guys now. I'm like, fuck that, man. These mm-hmm. even the blown 55ers are mm-hmm. so huge and strong now yeah. and fast. Like they'll you, uh, if you're not going into the same shape as they are, you're you can get yeah. killed, you know. Yeah. So, um What's that? sorry, uh, ignorance. What's the name of your one man show again? Is it uh, Robin Black Live? I have been calling it, but I've also I also called it Enjoyed the Hostilities when right, I right, did right. it at um, at the Fringe Festival. Yeah. How was how was the uh, Dublin one? It was wicked. Did you get a lot of people yeah. up for that? Yeah, was it, it was, pretty cool? Yeah, 150 maybe. That's cool. Yeah, and you, it was really good. Did you set it up through Kavanaugh? Is that who you did? Uh, I brought Kavanaugh as my guest. So oh, okay, I did, cool. I had John Kavanaugh as my guest in um, in Ireland. I set it up myself. Um, 
There was some reason I was over there. So I think there might have been some other reason I was going over to Europe at the time. Like now, the thinking of doing the show is if I'm somewhere commentating on a Saturday, try to set might the show as well up on go Friday. For it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm commentating bare knuckle boxing. Yeah, on uh, which is so awesome. I know. Um, I got. I got. A, I got approached 8. for that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. They actually asked me to play. Uh, I got asked to play Chris Lytle. Wow. Yeah. In uh, in the England yeah. one? No, Wyoming. Oh. oh, yeah. There's a few of them. I work for a. It's called BKB in England, um, and it is it. What I love. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of things I love about it, but. Uh, Part one of the things I love about it is like the culture of it. Like Me too. If I was gonna do it, I would go. I want to do it in the UK, sure. right? In a goddamn yeah. barn, or whatever. Like, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, and uh, there's a weird kind of like gentleman kind of thing. Like for a sure, there's a lot. There's gentleman. a lot of a lot of honor, honor and yeah. bare knuckle. Like it's not what people think. Yeah, the um, the Irish traveler family, yeah. like families. Yeah, it's been a part of their generation, and they take a lot of pride in like this yeah. is our man, and he's a good man, and he's a gentleman, and then he will knock you unconscious, and yeah. then he'll be a gentleman <laughs> again, and you guys will drink um, uh, Irish lager of some kind, Guinness or something. But um, there was a, f there, you know, they're not all from that, right? So uh, we were just I tangent a lot. This is the way my brain works, but I'm doing it um, in London the night before at this gangster's house. I'll tell you about that in a second. But, but um, <laughs> these, uh, yeah, um, Dave Courtney is his name. The, these guys kind of come out like this, and and they fight each other with this honor and this sort of respect, which you see somewhat in MMA. But uh, Goran Relic, who is um, from Croatia, no. Uh, He's from uh, Eastern Europe. He fought in KSW. He fought in the UFC. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. He was um, fighting. He is a bare knuckle champion there. He's one of the champions, and he's really good. He's, it suits him really well. He was fighting a gloved boxer from England, but they kind of went it, got into it at the weigh-ins, and then this big old boxer who's like now really heavy into bare knuckle gets a huge guy gets in and he shoves him apart and he starts screaming at them the whole room goes silent he's like we are gentlemen this is a gentleman and he's freaking out and he grabs their hands he goes you two shake hands right now and these they're just like little children well, getting said, shit. There's, there's that yeah. generation too where everyone knows like there's like you don't fuck with those yeah. guys right because not yeah. only they're uh, they were the best in their sport, yeah. like they, but they came, they ended up there for a reason because they were goons or, yeah. or kneecappers right. or whatever, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there is there is some of that. Like the guy who I'm doing my show the night before, uh, his name's Dave Courtney, and I saw Bisping um, in Calgary a week and a half ago, and I mentioned, he goes, oh yeah, I know Dave Courtney. Uh, Courtney was kind of around, kind of connected to the Cray brothers and all this kind of stuff over there, and he has like this, he calls it um, Camelot Castle. And he has this big old house, and he got a little venue in it with a stage and a bar. And yeah, everything. yeah. So I would do my show there for his for his gangster buddies. Fucking right, you know. But it's and take the ride wherever it takes you. Like, yeah, that's it. It's an adventure, right? That's that's what makes it so good. Like it's when you say you live a life of. Uh, like competing and traveling or entertaining, whatever, man, that's the best part. It's like, you don't, we were talking about this earlier. Like, you don't know where you are next month. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it'll take you from now to next month to do all the work to get there. Like, that's it. That's the, and that's the stuff no one will ever see. And it, there's also this very strange thing. Like, uh, you talk and you're a thinker and you're a, a, a philosopher and by nature and a teacher. So, Although this is your first podcast, it's very natural. It's comfortable. But at the same time, in 100, you'll go, oh, man, I, I'm so much better than I was then. Yeah, yeah, That's for sure. That's just logical, right? Like, through hard work and repetition, you get better at things. That's the plan. The, yeah, right? <laughs> right? Uh, somehow, today, people don't necessarily see, like, that that's the case. So I like to analyze and break down fights. And I've done 300 one-minute breakdowns, say, in the last this year which are amazing yeah, by thanks the way. man i love yeah. fucking i love to do some that. of the stuff you yeah. throw up there i yeah. fucking die yeah, some of it's amazing. for laughs for sure and it's fun and i did hundreds before that and then people will say oh well it, um or it'll pop up in conversation and somebody's like well we might bring you in for this or you know we might get x y or z fighter to do this it's like you understand it'll take him 600 just if he works really hard and he's passionate to be good enough to do it yeah, yeah. people seem to somehow it seems to be a modern thing that people think that things that require practice and training don't and anyone can do it like you see yeah. people fighting on the internet they've never fought a day in their life 
or people are saying, I'd like to fight on Dana White's contender series or whatever. They, it takes fucking many years and hundreds of hours or thousands of hours to get good at anything. Yeah, no, for sure. And then, but at the same time, there's that one fucking guy that can just walk yeah. in and do it too, yeah, right? Like I trained with Pearson for 15 years. Yeah. I've submitted him once. Wow. And the rest of the time was just him ragdolling me around the room. Like, yeah. But yeah, some guys are just naturals of what they do and they can walk in and do what we do. I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Not many though. Yeah. No, they're, no. they're, they're freak shows. Yeah. But. And it started somewhere. It's almost impossible to just naturally be a good high jumper or gymnast or yeah. runner or anything. Yeah. But if you, as a little kid, you trained in gymnastics or wrestling or you did something that shaped you as a, as a human early on in your career or you had to fight a lot because of where you grew up yeah. and it it's still trial and error you had hundreds of fights yeah, in it, your bad neighborhood you, you'd still well no you know. matter how much talent you have it's got to be cultivated right yeah so, so there, yeah there's definitely guys who defy the odds can come in and do things but for sure everything is trial and error and repetition and then grind all the time right so you know they never they never see it all so um uh, yeah, Taekwondo, Taekwondo was a kid. Where'd yep. you train Taekwondo? In Winnipeg. So I lived in a small town called uh, Pinawa, which was about an hour and 30 to, hour and, to an hour and 40 from Winnipeg. Pinawa uh, has a nuclear research plant. So it's like Springfield on The Simpsons. Fuck. And it's <laughs> like, there's, you drive down this highway and then you turn off on a road, literally a road to nowhere, because it'll end. And then there's a, a river... I forget what the actual river is. And then they took dynamite and they blew out this channel that connected the river so that it is a loop around this town. And we used to say when we were kids that yeah, like if a there moat. was a meltdown, they would just blow up the bridge and just stick us all there, which didn't make any sense. It wasn't like we were going to be radioactive, but that's how you think when you're a kid. But the, this moat was, they blew it up just with dynamite. So there's thousands, and it's in the Canadian Shield. So there's thousands and millions of these giant rocks all piled up on each side. It's fascinating. I, I still love, I haven't been there in 10 years, but I want to take my wife there. But w my parents would drive me an hour and 40 minutes into Winnipeg, and then I would train Taekwondo for two hours, and then they'd drive me an hour and 40 minutes back three times a week for like Jesus. eight years. Yeah. And uh, because I didn't like, I did, I just wasn't interested in anything other than martial arts. And it, like was at probably, all. it was probably hockey there, right? It was hockey. It, it was, uh, there was cross-country skiing. There was a little bit of biathlon where you ski and shoot guns. Eh. Yeah. Uh, eh. Yeah, I didn't have any interest in not just sports, like in much of anything. There was something about, and I, I was a gymnast as a little kid too, like a little, little kid from like three right through. I, I even, I went to university for a year and I took sort of university level gymnastic training too, which kind of helped me learn things physically later. But uh, yeah, they drove me in from the time, I mean, I started kind of nearby in a little town at about seven, but from about 12 till, or 11 until 18, I drove myself later. Yeah. They would drive me three times a week and they would sit there for two hours and literally do nothing. So now, now you'd have your phone or whatever. Yeah, yeah. My mom would just sit there and watch. Yeah, but it was yeah, it's the yeah. gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Yeah. So was it music that brought you to Ontario or, or um, was that something you started when you got here? So after early 20s and a little bit in high school, like a little bit in high school, Somehow I connected getting laid to being in a band. And I mean, that's a pretty I think natural. That's why everyone starts a band. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty natural connection, right? Like, you know, wearing a gi and doing kicks and stuff. Some girls thought that was cool. But if you grew your hair long and you could jump around <laughs> in, in a, and play in a band, girls like that better. So I started, I couldn't sing at all. And I still really cannot. And when I say that, people think I'm joking or like an ex-girlfriend before I met my wife would be like, oh, you're a professional singer. You're great. I'm like, I couldn't sing. I still cannot really sing. But that w didn't seem important to me. Like it seemed like I was, pr I was comfortable performing and leading a party and entertaining people. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I... I was drawn to figuring out how to be poetic or, f or write songs or craft outfits and stage shows and all of those things and i, I would, figured that I would be sorry enough. i like how you say outfits it's amazing yeah. <laughs> outfits <laughs> yeah and you know it's like that kind of stuff i i gravitated to and so i didn't do martial arts from from about nine from about 21 until about 27 no actually till my 30s but in that period and i was in winnipeg and i actually moved to toronto for a girl i moved to i was living in winnipeg i was playing with a band there and I wanted to go and do something bigger. And I wanted the band to move with me. But I, I met a girl in Winnipeg. 
um, that I fell in love with and lived with. And she moved to, back to Toronto where she had lived. And I moved with her. The band was saying they'd come. Last second, they bailed. So then I was in Toronto and I started a new band. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And um, like any good martial artist, you crashed and burned and fucked up your whole life and then found training? Yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. You know, like there was... I used to kind of regret the idea, feel like I stayed with a band, even though I wasn't going to be successful, whatever yeah, that yeah. would have meant, for a couple of years too long. But now I don't feel that way at all. I feel like the, the path of it was very, very natural and a certain amount of understanding, like sort of frustration and, and failure was a, an important part of it. But in that period, kind of as you go from getting a little bit bigger and people know your band more and your songs are better and your records do a little better and your tours do a little better to that stalling two periods, really it it's irreversibly connected to drinking way too much, yeah, doing yeah. a bunch of drugs. And it just, that's a part of, each one causes the other. Yeah, yeah. You know? And at some point you're sitting there in the middle of Europe playing shows. What, what, I, what I missed and felt... What was so hard to leave from it was whether it was a hundred or two hundred or sometimes three and four hundred people who loved your band. When you'd play, those people loved it and it moved them. Yeah. And it was really cool. That yeah. was really, really special. At, yeah, that level yeah. they came because they're fucking fans, not yeah. just because it was a concert, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. They came because they loved your band or your music or your message or what you did or something. And that was going to be really difficult to leave. And that's why I kind of stayed on too long. But really at by the last year, it was just like, you know, we'd get up in the morning and we would just start drinking right away. Yeah. Almost because it became like a dare. Like most other people can't do this, but we can do this. Yeah. And then if you that's drink, probably what everyone thinks until it's <laughs> exactly, too late. Exactly. And then most of the time you'll drink alcohol all day and then you get close to the show and you're kind of like, now you're a little slow and you never really get fully drunk when you live like that. Uh, well, you can, if you work hard enough, but you usually don't, you just, you know, have eight or 10 or 12 beers during the day and then you got to play in like an hour and you're kind of a little sluggish and somehow it has to go higher. So you know, any type of amphetamine or stimulant would be useful in this situation. But in England in particular, there was some weird kind of shitty trucker speed, like some kind of really like low level amphetamine powder. And we would just take lots of that stuff. And then you'd kind of barely sleep at all. And you'd have to get on the bus the next day to go somewhere else. And you just start, start the process again. So eventually you're really out of shape. You don't, your brain isn't working super well. You look like shit and you feel terrible. Yeah. And at some point after that, and I had a seizure kind of and that, uh, you know, is an inevitable, only one, which good because some people are like well that wasn't so bad i'm not all that and, bad yeah. and then they just keep living like yeah, that. yeah you don't learn from your mistakes yeah, right yeah but i um i i knew i needed to take a break and actually the, and this isn't when i tell the story the story is entirely truth of my life but i kind of leave out or i've never really sort of explained because when i do my one man show i say i had a seizure and the next thing you know i decided i wanted to fight in a cage and that sounds really good and in the Cole's notes of your life, that's true. But what really kind of happened in that period was I was like, I just need a fucking break. I need a break. And as soon as I took a break for about a week, I was like, you know, I feel like I need to learn something. Like if I start learning things, my life will get better. And because I'll have a goal, because I have no goal. The goal before was those 300 people loving your show yeah. every night. Right now I don't have one. So I decided... I wanted to train jujitsu because I watched so much martial arts and I was really into it and I never trained it. So I started training that every day and I started taking piano lessons. And then jujitsu was so much fun, I would just do skip piano lessons to go to jujitsu. And within about like a month or a month and a half, I was like, this is what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna fight. And that from, so I tell the story like it happened in one day when it was probably about a month or, or two months. And by that point, I trained with Kareem. I would go into jujitsu at 7 a.m., Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I think most of all five days, I would train noon till one. And then most nights, I would go out in from six till eight. And I think I got my blue belt in around three months. Really? Yeah. Holy shit, that's yeah. Fast. And I was fucking pretty good. Like, I was a... Now I'm still a blue belt. I haven't worn a gi in 10 years. I 
tapered it towards fighting, but I was a pretty good blue belt. Like I was one of those guys who had little, little specialties that when other guys that I was uh, had been training for a long time, they would want to roll with me because I was good at a couple things and they would know I was really, really good at typical small guy stuff at regarding being nearly impossible to pass, being able to regard and then trap you into things. I was really good at that really quickly. And so people want to train with me because they're like, okay, got to train my uh, uh, guard passing skills. Robin's small and flexible and quick with that, so I'll work with him. And it was good. I really loved it. I lo fucking loved it. And I haven't kind of committed the, the specialist thinking of, and I did that for probably six, eight, ten months before I really was forced to train hard in other things. But that specialist training, deep dive specialist training of something for the better part of a year, I haven't done that since then yeah. because now well, you have to you, learn you so gotta many be things. the jack of all trades yeah. for sure so yeah well, and my like, job now becomes understanding martial arts on the biggest scale possible yeah um, and the only way to do that is to train savat and belt wrestling and, and and wing chun and whatever i have to study them all yeah you know um do you think you'll go back into music at some point no i don't because i was going to start it i was going to yeah. i'm just looking for advice maybe that's what i'll do next right so. um well, since, can you sing or play any instrument? Fuck no. It, it's <laughs> meaningless. I, mean, I know. That, I know. Right? I can't sing or dance. That's can you why scream? we're here. Can you scream? Mm, I'm my kid. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think... You're on the path now, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and sorry to cut you off. Yep. Uh, I mentioned reinventing all the time, but the one common denominator in everything yeah. you've done, yep. whether it's uh, your music or prize fighter or a commentary or analyst, like the, the common denominator is that you've been an entertainer the entire time. Yeah. Right. So you could, yeah, whatever you're going to do is forward from here is going to be entertainment though. That's for sure. Right. I think so. Although as you get older, that becomes less of a buzz. And somewhere like the, for me now, the quality of the work is way more important. Mm. And even like my one minute breakdowns that I do, my voice is on there, but I'm not on there. And yeah, I don't, yeah. that doesn't bother. If my face was never on TV again, I don't think that would mean anything to me at all. And any, I love to be able to talk about martial arts and I love to entertain people and stuff. But if I never turned on television and go, oh, look, there's me in a suit. Like yeah, I would yeah. not miss that part of it. But, but teaching or sharing or... I'm into learning. I'm into, I'm really into learning. And when I learn something neat, I want to share it. And I think that's the primary motivation now yeah. is to find some interesting nugget and share it. And with long forms, like hanging out where you can just talk with somebody, it's less necessary to learn it and fully flush it out. And even more valuable now to flush it out in a long conversation or for weeks or months. We could we could keep talking for weeks and months until we hit on something. But the process of figuring it out now, I think, interests people. Yeah. I think other people are interested yeah, in that. Yeah, for sure. Um, what about uh, let's uh, like a Fight Network kind of vibe again? Would you do something like that? Is that something you really enjoyed? Or yeah, I know when that went down, you were like, that was a drag, man. Like the yep. way that. It kind of went down. Yeah, so I, I was working at Fight Network with, again, Ram Dean being, John Ram Dean being one of my best friends was a big part of why that was so special. It was also like a 12-minute walk from my house. And, uh, and I work for TSN now, and some of the, the work has some of the elements of it. I'll stand in a, at a desk, and I'll talk about fighting for an audience. The special thing about that one is for 50 hours a week, we could literally talk about fighting. We'd sit in an environment and study it deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And I do like doing that. It's, I just don't know. The world changes so fast that I don't even know if other than TSN yeah. and in Canada, we have a second one. And in America, they have Fox Sports and yeah, ESPN. Yeah. I don't know that any other ones will pop up. So I yeah, think yeah, I yeah, have truly. the job that I can have in Canada. It's the best job that probably has there's ever been in the country for talking about fighting. Yeah. It's at the big network, do around smart people, doing cool stuff. So I think I have the best MMA television job that's ever existed yeah. in Canada. So there's yeah. nowhere else to go there. Uh, and I just nurture that and do the best job I can. But commentary, I think, is the big one for me. Yeah, yeah. I want to do hundreds and hundreds of more uh, things of commentary. I, I personally think, and I see this in everything in life, people just emulate what came before. Yeah. You know, Conor McGregor's fighting Habib Nurmagomedov. And the converse, I just was doing um, breaking down and analyzing... Mark Coleman versus Marie Smith. Yes. Right? <laughs> UFC 14. 
It is the setup, the presentation, the way that they roll. It's like Mark Coleman is a wrestler. He's got killer ground and pound. He's physically strong. Um, and uh, Murray Smith is a striker. He's got devastating punches and kicks. This is 20 years later. It's being discussed exactly the same fucking way. Yeah. There's no way that we've worked on something for 20 years and done such a piss poor job of evolving our understanding that we're doing the same thing. And that's what I want to do. I want to make it better than that. I want to make it deeper or smarter yeah. or simpler even. You know what? Uh, you know what? I, you break down everything amazing. The one thing you bring... Uh, better than anyone and like me up there with rogan is man you are fucking passionate fucking like look how it. fucking fired up you got mm -hmm. there just talking about it right their <laughs> eyes come out of your head yeah. but like so that's something you you could talk about commentating is really just talking about what's happening in yeah. front of you but there's a lot of work that goes into that you have to yep. understand what's going down right yep. but no one no one delivers it with a hard on like you do yeah <laughs> that's i've never said it with a hard on and uh, uh but <laughs> lies, and lies, you're lying. And, and, <laughs> well no i mean i've probably had one but i've never this i've never described it as i say it with a hard on because that a lot of people are like bro bro <laughs> like what the fuck but um the, the guy, that gangster in England where I'm doing a show, Dave Courtney, when I interviewed him about bare knuckle boxing, and he's, he is like got gold all over him. He's wearing this like old expensive suit. And he actually put on the very first sort of relaunch of bare knuckle boxing in his backyard. That's where it happened at this gangster's backyard. And it was called uh, Be Bad, something B, uh, B, B B A D something. Anyways, and I'm interviewing him and I'm talking about it. He goes, you know, when you watch these guys fight, he says, you know, doesn't it make you horny? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, not yeah. I don't know how I can phrase this in any way that won't be wrong, but I totally know what you're saying. <laughs> like, does it make you <laughs> no, not in like look they're fighting way, but in that sort of like hungry metaphorically metaphorically yeah, yeah, yes. yeah no, for sure. and i'm looking at him going i'm glad you said that because if the guy that they flash up wearing eye makeup and tight pants <laughs> says that fighting makes me horny i'm fucked yeah you've right? already yeah people yeah. are already on the fence yeah, right? exactly so. <laughs> but he could say that and there's a metaphor in there about it that if you're being sort of truthful about the truth of what it is the nature of combat the nature of fighting and what it means there's a metaphor there this is not one that that the culture is ready to accept yeah and i, I knew where he, he yeah. was coming from yeah. so awesome but you know what the one thing i i like admired about the fight network thing is like you could watch you progress you got yeah. better and better and better at the job all the mm -hmm. time and it was cool to watch that. Like, so you. when you guys got let go i was like fuck those assholes right but what are you gonna do and uh because now there's no it's there's no content at all now it's no. just lot it's just yeah video. Part, so that that experience so before i go on you got a deep poster there yeah who fought in deep antonio oh he did right of course antonio see them all the shooto, yeah. all the shootos yeah, behind yeah, you right of course of course ram dean and i commentated probably 150 somewhere between 150 and probably closer to 250 cards of best of deep cool Just, yeah it was amazing we learned so much but that so the the cool thing for us, and I, I can't go back and watch it because I don't have all the, the footage, or we have almost none, but the cool thing for us was we literally, at first, nobody watched Fight Network. It was a 24-hour combat sports channel available in Canada that literally you and Claude Patrick and yeah. you know yeah. 200 people that were heavily involved in fighting probably watched. So we could do whatever, we could just learn and fail in front of everybody it's like mm -hmm. well you didn't nail that but that's okay because you're doing eight hours a day of talking about fighting you're gonna fuck up here and there and over time you do eight hours a day of anything especially if you care you will get better and we got to do that in front of people who watched it but when you look at so what happened was that company did what a lot of companies do, which is buy other things, mm -hmm. you know, like nobody's ever just only a garage anymore or only runs their gym. You have a gym and a, now you have a podcast. Do you have any other businesses? Not that I can mention on air. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, and, uh, some gray market businesses, but people, they, you know, so they would run a fight network and then like the strategy is, and, and I'm not giving away anything. This was public. The strategy is we will have many of these things that appeal to the same demographic and we'll use our resources 
which will become cheaper. So we have a studio. Studio is expensive for Fight Network, but if it's a studio for Fight Network and a fantasy sports network and an extreme sports yeah, channel yeah. and so forth, it becomes cheaper. And so that's what they did. And in the pro, Fight Network was profitable and successful in the way we did it. But all some of those other things, the nature of acquiring businesses, they weren't. So the big picture of it was like, if we can cut that department, maybe. So it just becomes bean counters doing bean yeah, counter yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and bean counters, and that's not a, a negative. We need people to count beans. Somebody's got to count the beans. Yep, yep. Um, the, uh, they don't have an emotional attachment to anything, mm -hmm. right? So that's, it. but, you know, I also learned, and I, I hesitate to tell people this, my friends or people that watch podcasts or you're sharing ideas, but no job is stable. No job in the whole world is stable. Yeah. Like name anything. It's like I work for the government. Well, they cut they cut the government. Yeah. They cut uh, costs in the government. Well, we drive a truck. Well, now they just have driverless trucks. Like there's not a single job on planet Earth that's stable. That's terrifying to a lot of people. But if you accept that truth of it, you're a little. And I didn't at first. It was terrifying. But now I'm a little more comfortable with the fact that. Everything in the world changes all the time. The only constant is change. Yeah. I live in a different town um, than I lived six months ago, and I didn't expect to do that. And I have, and I was working in China or Russia, and I didn't expect to do that. And I just started a job in the Middle East, and I didn't expect to do that. And I'm doing a bunch of breakdowns for Bellator that come out next week. I didn't think I'd be doing I, that. It's amazing. Yeah. I, it, it happens you know. to me all the, like, monthly. I'm like, how the Fuck did I get here, man? Like, I'd, where were you recently? Uh, After Thailand, are you going somewhere next week? Are you I'm there? leaving for Austria on Sunday, and yeah. well, I missed you in Dublin by like a week. Fuck. I was that in Dublin, Germany. So I saw Pearl Jam in Germany. Cool. Took my son to his first concert. Cool. And I, that was his first concert ever. Yeah. Was Pearl Jam yeah, in Germany? My, my kids Look, got it made, man. Dude, no kidding. I've, yeah, I've been at twelve or thirteen countries in the last like twelve months. And when I grew up, like I, I've never left my hometown, like to, yeah, unless amazing. it was go to the beer store. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I, and now I, every once in a while, I'm like, how the hell did we end up here? Like how, right here in this room? Like how the fuck did this yeah, happen? So like, great. Yeah, it's what? your fault. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks for chiming in on this whole yeah. thing, by the way. But why, like, do, I did, why do you travel though? Like, uh, why? What is the purpose? Uh, and I know the answer, but I'm just. Uh, it's. I don't sit still very well. Yeah. I'm like you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love the adventure and yeah. I want to see as much as I possibly can. Yeah. And like, I, may, I feel like I'm making up for mm -hmm. lost time. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I spent so much time fucking up my life at an early age that I'm like, I feel like I got to get everything in now. Yeah. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have to live in the, and have a career and freedom and like the people that, might, that support me and my wife and family. And they're like, yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. Like I got to. I got does to your wife think you're crazy or does she know you're crazy? Uh, crazy people don't know they're crazy. Right. But does their, do their wives know they're crazy? Uh, you know what? <laughs> she, I, she's, I'm, your stuff about me, she doesn't understand, but it doesn't matter because she yeah. accepts it, right? Yeah. And then most of the things I want to do, uh, she encourages. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, go for it. And the other stuff she doesn't want me to do, she's... She's like, yeah, go for it anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, or you're yeah. gonna do it, whether yeah, I want you know, well, that's to do a lot it of it too. Like, yeah. I gotta, we, I went to Europe with my family a few weeks ago, and now I'm gonna go again by myself. And I know she's like, fuck, you know, but she's still gonna be like, yeah, go for it. I'll drive to the yeah, airport. Wicked. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's, uh, and that's that's everyone in my life. I have a few good friends that are like, that's a bad idea. I'm like, okay, yeah, you, trust right? them because you need people like yeah. that to tell you that sh that's stupid. Yeah, <laughs> right? it's true. And if they say it, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. we're all surrounded by a certain amount of yes men as well. Like if yeah. they say it, you know, they, you're like, yeah, okay, I'll take that into consideration, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's, what you're, that's what your wife is for. It's yeah. like, she's like to tell you you're being an idiot and reel you in. Right. Yeah. And sometimes you won't listen and then she'll say, I told you so. And you'll be like, I kind of knew all along. I just couldn't stop myself from doing that yeah, dumb yeah. thing. And I, I, sorry, yeah. I have people in this gym that are like that as well. So like I, my, uh, the girl that manages, she, she'll, she'll like, she'll reel me in every once in a while. Like, eh, I don't know. Or like, uh, the uh, sure, give me an idea. I'm like, it's a bad idea, but then I'll come back to her. And a couple of days later, I'm like, you're right. That's a good yeah. idea. Let's do <laughs> that. Right. So like you need people around yeah. you all the time that, uh, to, to di help you stay disciplined, but also help to feed your ego and let you allow you to do things that you really want to do as well, right? So I, I think one of the bigger challenges that I have right now, and I think a lot of people feel this way. I think this is not an abnormal thing because is I don't see or communicate with my friends as much as I would like mm. due to being busy or this travel or all of these things. You know, don't you find that that you go through these periods and you're like, shit, I could really stand to like make I, contact with this person or I, I haven't do, seen this person. I, I do. I do. Um, you know, I grew up on, um, 
my friend's couch, his parents, they're like my adopted parents. They took incredibly good care of me as a, as a young man. And then when he, he, I, he went away to school and I started doing some other shit and finally he bought a condo. So I bought the condo upstairs next to him and then he went and bought a house in Oshawa. So I bought the house across <laughs> the street and my greatest friend lives across the street and uh, I'd see him like once every couple months, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'd say my other best buddies, they're all around the corner, you know what I mean? You can always call them, they'll always be there. But yeah, like I decided that I was going to take this ride and as much as I miss certain things, I'm like, I don't ask permission and I'm like, and I don't put anyone second, but like, I'm like, this is what I'm doing, man. Yeah. Like, and I stopped asking permission a long time ago. This is, this is my fucking adventure. You're in or you're out, right? But yeah, for sure. There's people I miss and, uh, you know, but you put your family before anything. Mm -hmm. And then this, this adventure and the, and my, which is my job and my, uh, my, uh, my passion to travel and every, all the other dumb shit I do. Like, gather that's, information. That's, yeah, that's yeah. number, all these other things, that's number two. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully my friends file into that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, and, but the good thing for me is a lot of my friends are directly involved. Like yeah. my best friends train with me here. So I don't yeah. miss out on a lot of it, but like, you know, you have your friends that you train with or, or that you're, mm -hmm. you know, on your ride with. And then there's your, your oldest friends and you know, you can call. Yeah. Anytime and they'll be there. But yeah, I get it. Like there's some days you feel like fucking missing out yeah. on a lot of things. I haven't seen my best, my best friend in the world. His daughter is going to turn one and I've met her yeah. like in a couple weeks. So I've met her once, you know it's what I mean? I'm like, shit like that. That's happens. a year. Yeah. yeah. That's a year. Yeah. And it's, uh, but you know what happens it's yeah. but that's that's life we all change if you're the same man that you were when you're 20, you fucked up your whole life anyway. Exactly. So just always think about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. And imagine like, a lot of the time we don't notice how much the world changed, but if you didn't change too, then you're just some dinosaur stuck in something you don't understand. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, man. My life is fucking fantastic. Yeah. And both of us, it could have yeah. turned out a lot worse. Yeah, right? Big time. So. Big time. And, you know, even just when you say that out loud, every now and again, you have to remind yourself, what well, still could if I, I, don't, if I don't do correct, I'm, I'm, make good choices along the way. I'm riding the unicycle down the middle. Yeah. I can <laughs> tip either way. Yeah, that's right. You don't know. So, yeah. what's, uh, so what's, on the ne what's next on the list for you? So uh, tomorrow's my birthday. No shit. Yeah. Yeah. You're older uh, than me too. Yeah, I like that. I'll, I'll be 49 tomorrow. Jesus. Yeah, I know. That's weird. Uh, so I'm getting on a train and I'm going to Ottawa where Jeff Harrison, yep. you know, Jeff Harrison, he has a gym in Ottawa. He's passionately like wanting to innovate as a, as a gym owner. And he asked me to come in, to develop a little um, sort of a breakdown, kind of showing different perspectives of what, and he, it was really cool the way he approached me. He's like, I want you to do a seminar before you say no and say, you're not a black belt in jiu-jitsu or you're not a world champion or whatever. You have a perspective that I'd like you to share with my people. And I'm like, super cool. So I've kind of been developing this thing where we just put a TV up, put a little uh, Apple TV box, and have my iPad, and I show different things. Mm -hmm. And then him and his coaches go in with in little groups with students and explore ideas. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna do that on Saturday, which is, Kind of nerve wracking, but also super exciting. And he's paying me too. He's bringing me there and paying me to develop this thing that maybe I can do in other places. Awesome. And so, yeah, but well, it has been a lot of work, but everything's worth doing is well, a lot of work. That you're, don't yeah. doubt yourself, man. Yeah. You're, you're, um, black, you're black belt and talking, like, and just, and, get, and, <laughs> and, and watching. I'm yeah. a black belt and watch. I believe that my skill is watching, learning, and then showing people interesting things from that yeah. I've learned. Yeah, I think that's sure. the, the thing. And then talking, uh, I talk a lot. Now, all right. So one more, uh, another thing. Yep. Give me, uh, give me a breakdown on uh, your professions. How many times have you, has Robin Black reinvented himself? From, okay, from a young man. Okay, so I was a martial artist in high school, and then I wanted to sing in a rock band. And before I sung in a rock band, I figured I better have a job, so I became a hairdresser. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So that, yeah, because then I could still have long hair, look crazy, and play a rock band. So, martial artist, hairdressing school. While I'm a hairdresser, I became a singer in a rock band. While I was a singer in a rock band, I um, also learned to do a bit of television by being interviewed lots of times. Learned to write a little bit. Uh, I directed some music videos. So all I, I have this philosophy. It's like 
the guy who becomes the admiral of the navy, if he started in the in the the engine room of a ship, he learned everything he could about the engine room of the ship, and then to get better, he had to understand the ship. So he learned everything he could about the ship. So then to get better, he had to understand the navy. So then you learn everything you can about yeah. the navy, and that, and it's a really simple but logical philosophy. So then, yeah, I learned to direct music videos, write songs, etc. And then I had a seizure, so I decided I was going to learn some other stuff. So I started training jujitsu, and then I decided to become a prize fighter. And then really becoming a prize fighter was an ingredient because I wanted to be a commentator. But I knew you motherfuckers would never let me commentate anything unless I fought at least one time, which was fun. So I fought nine times. <laughs> then I became a commentator. And then um, now I analyze fighting, travel the world commentating it and do sort of podcasts and analysis. The next thing I want to do, I think, is the, all the things I'm doing now, but also share ideas that are larger concepts that I've learned through martial arts, but I haven't figured out exactly how to do that yet. But that's maybe the next. I thing. lost count. Like yeah, a, hair, it's a, a, a hairdresser, yeah. I was fucking yeah. gone. So. What, about, uh, what about YouTube too? You produce a, like a yeah. shitload of content yeah. online. So I, yeah, uh, um, we have twenty five thousand followers on YouTube, which YouTube literally was like. So Fight Network decided they weren't going to. They were going to tear down that studio, and we weren't going to make anything anymore. And all of us lost our entire department, lost our jobs, and. All I could think of was, I have to do something. Uh, I don't know what I should do, but I know that if I don't do something, I can't, what I couldn't do is just let this end. Yeah. I also couldn't just go see if there was a job somewhere else and then realize six months later I had done nothing in the world had passed me by. So um, my friend Mark, I didn't even know him. I got a message on Facebook from this guy, Mark Manaharan. His brother Tony is a Muay Thai fighter that I had coincidentally sparred with a lot. Um, under Billy Martin, the boxing coach. Oh, cool. Billy would bring him in to spar with me when I was fighting. But Mark didn't tell me this. He wanted to earn sort of this on his own. Sent me a Facebook message and said, listen, I could. why don't we start doing podcasts so I can produce them for you? And I said, well, I, I have an audience on YouTube. Do you know how to shoot? And then he gave me the answer that everybody should give, which is the truth. He was like, no, I don't. But I'll work really hard and I'll figure out how to do it within a week. That's and pretty, I was we're like, doing that right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, cool. So he came over to my house. We'd never met. He set up the camera and I sat down and I said, I'm a white belt in this, but not only am I going to do my best at it, I'm going to show people along the way what we did right and wrong and try to do that. Cool. And we, and um, somebody from, a couple people wrote about it because I guess I had done a good job and moved a few people with my work before. And I and Joe Rogan retweeted my first one. That's cool. Which was pretty cool. Uh, Joe's a really, really great friend. And uh, so I think I had about 5,000 followers in the first month. Cool. And then now we have 25,000. And mostly, I, much like this, only by myself, um, which is harder because I nobody... Can, nobody yeah. helps shape my thinking. I just sit and talk, and Mark shoots it and puts it on YouTube and and um, and on Stitcher and iTunes and everything. And, and no matter what I commentate, which is my paying job, and no matter what I get paid to analyze or break down, like the Bellator work I'm doing now and some other ones, I'll always do this because I think I've learned so much by just throwing my thoughts out into the world and thinking out loud, mm -hmm. um, it's been really valuable. I feel like I'm a way smarter person, but also more confused too. Like the smarter <laughs> you get, the more yeah. confused you get. The more to think about, right? Yeah. The more information you have, the more, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the more fucked yeah. up you're gonna be. So yeah. amazing. Yeah. Plus you get into gray areas, like, like the thing going on with Facebook, are you, are you able to talk about that a little bit? Where Facebook? they've kind of like so, shut down the one minute breakdowns? Yeah, so, uh, so, I, so I do my one minute breakdowns and I basically just grab footage of people fighting and then figure out something interesting that I think people will like. So, for example, I did something on um, uh, a um, Muay Thai fighter just the other day, just yesterday, called Abasolo. Do you know this guy? Have you seen this yet, Brooklyn? Mm -mm. No. Uh, oh, yeah, I see. I see no Eddie Abasolo. And, it, and I did it, it took about 10 minutes, and 154,000 people watched it on Twitter. Amazing. Like, look, it says 154,000. Oh, I did see that. It's yeah. spinning at back yeah, elbow. Yeah, spinning yes. elbow over the top. And I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, how many people can they put in Sky Dome? Like 120,000. Yeah. So, and you picture all those people there, and it's like, wow, that's so fucking wild that they all watch it. So I do those things, and I put them on the internet. And I'll take old, cool fights, take some Kid Yamamoto over here, and like a Muay Thai fighter over there, and some jujitsu thing, and I put them up. And then UFC... For some reason, and and this is my just my opinion, but I think it's dated, and I think it's counterintuitive to growth. Um, they say people can't use the fo this footage; it belongs to us. Now, 
so they shut down like I don't know, maybe fifty or a hundred Instagram pages mm -hmm. and Facebook pages of people who used it, including mine. And so a good friend, I have some friends over there. I do different work for them at different times, and TSN's a broadcast partner, and I, I have worked hard to celebrate their fighters. They were like, okay, let, we'll try to help get it back up. So they got Instagram back up, but they never got my Facebook page back up. Uh, so my mom's really mad. My mom's really <laughs> mad. For real. Like, what I noticed now is like, fuck, like 150,000 people watch that on Twitter. And on Instagram, sometimes 40, 50, 60,000 people watch it. So I get to share it. I don't miss Facebook at all, except my mom's mad. Yeah. Like, my mom is like, why aren't you on Facebook? And I'm like, well, mom, you can go. And she's like, no, I don't have those other things. I'm not learning any other things. Yeah. Get so I could just start another Facebook page, but oh, it'll get back yeah. up anyway, yeah. man. Like you're all, they'll get over it. Whatever. Yeah, there's a parallel to like Aussie Man reviews. Like I don't know the, the Australian guy. Yeah, who I've does seen some, some of his work. They his is mostly thing. comedic, right? Yeah. 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 yeah he got I, his back up, so I feel like did? there's got to be a way to get it. It was his down. His yeah. Facebook when, page? when the the, orig the very first yeah. McGregor Diaz fight, he yeah. stayed it, and then he had to use Lego to like redo the video. <laughs> yes. Lego and ketchup. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So let's just. Oh, shit, we've been at this for a while. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's pretty, pretty natural. Who, who thought? It might be longer than that, to be yeah. honest with you. It might be a little bit longer. There's so something beautiful about talking, man. That's it. I'm, I'm okay yeah. with it. Let's well, before we wrap up, I, I do want to get like yeah. just your thoughts on some current events because sure. they just announced like a couple huge fights. Like, yeah. obviously, Connor could be. That was my next thing, yeah. Yeah, that's Go the ahead, biggest yeah. one. We definitely yeah. need just to get your thoughts, yeah. like both of you, on that fight. Well, the biggest thing for me about Connor and Khabib is what we were talking about earlier, which is. Uh, Mark Coleman versus Murray Smith at UFC 14 is we all are sitting around looking at it as exactly the same thing. And it isn't the same thing. We're like, if this guy can close the distance and take him down, he'll dominate him on top and he'll beat the shit out of him and he'll ride his wrist or get him in a crucifix or yeah. control his back and beat the crap out of him. But can he close the distance without getting rocked by this guy's left hand? That's all anyone's going to talk about. There, and it's going to happen on every television show, this same conversation Absolutely. over and over and over and over again. And there's fucking more to it than that. There always is. And it isn't just, well, strike your way in or who's the better striker or take down defense. There's something along the lines of the ability to perform and affect each other psychologically and emotionally. That'll be the most important part. Yeah, of that's what McGregor uh, is a goddamn genius at it. You know, like, like yeah, I, I, I'm going to just break down the same yep. thing you just yep. said, like, McGregor is accurate and hits fucking harder than anyone at that weight class. And uh, and he he can actually, his timing is amazing. Yep. And he can put a guy to sleep with one punch. Yep. And, and he's uh, done it many times. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he's, his ability to survive when he is on his back is awesome. But at, at the same time, uh, the Russian is a goddamn animal, man. Yep. Like he will put you down over and over yep. and over again. And just, but you're, you're not physically, sorry, not emotionally, mentally going to break McGregor. He's, yeah. a, he's a killing machine right to the very end, right? And But can... McGregor psychologically affect this Russian. If theoretically, you look at it and you're like, if you know anyone from from Dagestan, yeah. if you've known how they these men become this, in theory, there's no chance. Yeah, and he's the, not scared of yeah, much. The, you know how you become Habib is it? Yes, we have footage of him wrestling a bear, and we know he's trained from his, the time he was like three years old. But it's not just that. At three years old, well, let's say ten. At 10 years old, we take a thousand kids from the area and they all fucking fight each other. And at 14, there's only a hundred left. And then they all fucking fight each other. And then at 19, there's only 10 left. And then at 25, there's only one left. And there's no other way in, in Russia, in those yeah. of that area of the world. That's how it's done. So you're the guy that could never be broken. That's why you end up there. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is fascinating it's, to me. It'll be the biggest fight of all time. Yeah. Like, MMA fight probably yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. If I... The UFC's marketing is amazing, man. I, I won't watch them forever, and then yeah. one little thing will pop up, and they'll yeah. sell me out. I'm like, fuck, yeah. now i got to watch, right? So, what, what the, I, I love to, to work for, when I work for TSN, this is the biggest thing in the country that I grew up in that I watched all the time with the, the channel that talks about sports, and I'm the guy who gets to talk about the UFC and fights like this, and I fucking love that. That's the coolest thing for me. Um, but when I watch little bits of, of the UFC's presentation, the only thing that I, when you say you don't watch it for a while, it's the, it's the same thing over and over yeah. and over and over and over again. And that's my complaint as a fan, um, is that it's so unbelievably formulaic. And my job is to find ways to not fall into that formula and find ways to show it 
in this country and talk about it in this country that doesn't fall into the same formula. Because mm-hmm. if, if the conversation is exactly the same as the conversation from UFC 14, then we haven't done a very good job at all. Yeah. We failed. We failed the viewers. <coughs> but you know, that's thing. MMA fans are the most, <laughs> they're pretty basic. Yeah. And they're very fickle fans. And like they, it's, and especially with the way that it's gone with the Fox sports, it's like bigger, faster, stronger. And that's yeah. what they're selling anyway. It doesn't matter. People don't know what they're watching. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, that should be our job. Um, because the Fox stuff, less people watch it all the time. Now there's lots of reasons for mm-hmm. that that have to do with television and have to do with, you know, TV rights and ESPN and all these things. But less people watch it all the time. That mm-hmm. means maybe we should try something else. Maybe it is too simple. Maybe it is too repetitive. You know, maybe it is too, you know, oh my God, that's a crazy head kick. Maybe it's too much about spectacle. Like there's some fascinating shit happening there that if you find the simplistic way to show it to people. I mean, you know, poker, you ever watch poker on TV? Fuck no. No. Okay, well, you and I sit around and we're gambling. You put that on TV, nobody fucking gives a shit. One day they put the camera underneath it so people could see what what cards he had. True. And then everybody wanted to watch it. Mm. They put one sim- single, simple, single camera underneath each guy to show what we had and then the audience was like holy fuck this guy's gonna he's fucking this guy yeah, yeah. if you yeah, can show yeah. that angle to people who, about fighting they would view fighting different forever you know, what is that angle what do you think that angle is a big part of it is when somebody there's a number of them but there's one one thing that i tend to do and that is to question what we're what we've always talked about when people who studied fighting described fighting to somebody else. They described it as if uh, often, we've seen this a million times, how to do a triangle. My job isn't to, and nobody's job is to tell someone how to do a triangle. Our job is to tell someone how to watch a triangle. Our job isn't to say he's now in half guard. Our job is to say that hip right there is stopping him from moving. Mm -hmm. No, No viewer needs to know what the fuck half guard is. No viewer needs to know what a tie clinch is. It doesn't matter. They need to know that if somebody's forearms are in your collarbone and they're pressing down here, holy shit, that sucks. And I'm gonna get kneed in the face. Like, we don't need to teach people to do martial arts. We need to teach people to watch martial arts. And that's not that complicated. It really isn't. Well, it, it isn't for me because yeah, that's you, what I've been doing for a decade. Hundred percent. And I, I understand yeah. where you come from, but at the end of the day, like people just want to see violence. That's what they're always doing. Like I can watch beautiful yeah. two yeah. wrestlers grind it out and hit the most amazing stuff off the fence and whatever. I'm like, that was amazing. Yeah. Sell that to the average guy. They but want you they understand, understand it. two guys crushing yeah. each other. That's it. Yeah. 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 But, so I don't think people have the time or patience to ever like take that point of view. Mm-hmm. They just want to see someone go to sleep, right? True. Everyone understands yeah. a punch in the face. Yeah. So. Well, they don't, but they recognize it. If they've been punched in the face, <laughs> then you really then understand. Then you really understand. When yeah. that flash hits and your brain feels weird, and then it feels like you're on mushrooms for a few seconds because time is different and shit. If they, if people have been hit like that, you know that feeling where it's like, yeah, I've, I've been there yeah. more times than I can count. Yeah, so. like, and it's so hard. If you've experienced it, like when I when you watch somebody get kicked in the head and then that leg goes, I felt that thing and it's a and it felt normal as I stepped it, but that electric shock that came up there and oh, it wobbled and then horrible. as I wondered what that meant and somebody hit me again, like that's so interesting. But you're right. Uh, you have to have that happen to some degree to truly appreciate it, which is also why the world is full of really, really bad discussions about fighting by people who've never fought yeah for like, sure it's know. a whole different perspective when you've been kicked in the face yeah, for or sure, it has so. just a nose full of blood yeah i mean it's so different when you can't breathe yeah for sure <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what else you got there, John? That's pretty much it. Yeah, I just All wanted right. to know what you guys thought about yeah. the, the most recent fight announcements. Yeah. And maybe Diaz or something like that. Yeah. Diaz is yeah. coming back That's now. That's cool. It'll be Diaz yeah. Poirier, maybe? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That's, if, That's, if he makes it to the ring, he said he might not. And he, that's always, he's just fucking with people. Yeah. He loves it. So. He sells it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and he's mad. Like, he's mad about this stuff. He's always going to kind of be mad. Like, those guys are millionaires now. It's um, because of him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nate and Nick are, are millionaires now, and their life should be better. But being mad and being kind of pissed off at the world, Doesn't it's just who they are. Like, if yeah. the world fucking sucks, like, you know, that was unfair. Uh, like, I only made six, let's say he made $2 million. I only made $2 million. That fucking Irish guy made eight. Like, you made $2 million. Yeah, like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, you should be happy about that. But there's something, I just, like, there's something so fascinating about being mad at the world until the level of greatness like those guys are. You know what I mean? They're yeah. just, they just, they're, it's almost like hate 
And I, and I know part of this is performance and they're making sure to sell us, but something about resentment and hate has driven them to greatness. Well, someone's trying to take something from them and they got it like, yeah. yeah so, all right. Um, uh, you got five seconds. What favorite band of all time? One band. BJ Penn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're a music guy. You got yeah. one band that you always go back to the well for. Mm. Tick, tick, tick. My favorite album ever. I'll take that. Yeah, is uh, Frampton. Frampton comes alive. Yeah, that's pretty, that's yeah. a good choice. I'll accept that. Yeah, and, you and don't the, even know what we're yeah. talking about. No, that. Not like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The reason that's so brilliant to me is because that was like on a night. You know yeah, what I mean? I know, like yeah. on that, that day, that and there's something we'll never be able to appreciate that in music uh, like we could then. Because now, if somebody captures like a concert, they'll run it through all kinds of technical shit, and it won't sound like that. Yeah. That was just a bunch of mics set up. Yeah, while those and then guys you pulled played. it off, and those people yeah. got to see it yeah, happen. Exactly. That's pretty, and you pretty hear rad. it. It's a moment, you know, and that's one of the reasons fighting so cool. Like those are moments you never get them back. You only played. They put the mics on, and he played that fucking concert, and it was brilliant. They put the cameras on, and you fight, and it goes the way it goes. Like the moment, like being great in the moment, is so much more special yeah, to yeah. me than. Than being, you know, the being brilliant at writing something and then being brilliant at crafting it in a studio is really a cool thing. But on one night in some place in an outdoor stadium that to happened, be yeah. that great, you know, yeah, that's that's cool. I think cool. it's still the the largest selling live album of yeah, all time. Should as be. Well. It's, it's, it's genius, amazing, yeah. awesome. All right, yeah. I think uh, we're gonna wrap yeah. it up because. I uh, dropped really the ball fun. and forgot my shit at home. I got to go see, get it oh, before yeah, I start yeah, working. Yeah, we're, we, yeah, we're teaching. Uh, we're gonna, Robin's going to help me Billy, Billy Madison some kids tonight. <laughs> so it's going to work <laughs> out pretty good. So Ten year olds? Uh, it'll be uh, at least 11 and under. Yeah, You're gonna, so I can uh, take every one of these kids. Yeah, that's, that's a great fucking theory, but I lined up by uh, my ringers for today. <laughs> so um, I think that was a good first crack out there, boys. Podcast. That was a podcast. Nah, man, yeah, you man. make it. The reason I want you first because you make it so easy, right? Like you're a pro, you know how to talk, and I always enjoy my time with you. So I really well, appreciate thank it. Thank you. To me, the the hanging out and talking, we make it more complicated. The mm -hmm. nature of what it is, like you know, being a pro five years ago was standing around and understanding where the camera was and stuff. Yeah. Now you go out the other side where you don't have to think about it anymore. You just naturally hang. It's like fighting. First you have to think about an arm bar and then eventually you just do it. And whether you're, and you feel like that now, you literally just hung out and talked. So that's a pretty good sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a blue belt. Yeah. And podcasting yeah. now. Yes. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That was, that was a great, uh, great start to our adventure. I appreciate it. I felt so thanks for your time. Josh, you fucking man. Put me I on try. his podcast in his, in his in his spare bedroom, and now this shit's happening. Yeah, so I, 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 I thank you a lot too. Yeah, we've, we've come um, away, but people, fans, man, have a mission, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. Everyone needs goals. Everyone needs missions. If you don't know what your mission in is, just be kind to people. If you're kind to people all the time, then your mission will, mission will get laid out in front of you, and you know exactly what to do. So, Robin, Robin Black, yeah, oh, fuck man, thanks, thanks man. dude, thank that was you. good. All right, guys, real quick, before we wrap up, just tell the people where they can find you, what you're doing the most recent. I think you're going to Ottawa, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to Ottawa tomorrow, and then I'm going to London September 7th. Uh, if you follow my Twitter and Instagram, you can get tickets if you're in London, England. I'm at a gangster's house telling stories. <laughs> and then the, then the next night, I am commentating bare knuckle boxing in the O2 arena. That's at the yeah, O2, that's too. The O2. That's amazing. Yeah. And then two weeks after that, I will be in Abu Dhabi doing live commentary for Brave Combat Federation. And then in October, I'm going to Las Vegas to cover uh, McGregor versus uh, Khabib for TSN. And after that, I don't know. Yeah, I never thought I would say this <laughs> in my life, but I, I kind of want to be Robin Black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to be you, so we can trade. Just like a younger version, though. Yeah. So. Right. so is it Robin Black MMA on Instagram? And Robin Black MMA on Instagram and Twitter. Robin, uh, YouTube.com slash Robin Black on YouTube and uh, uh, my mom's mad I'm not on Facebook right now <laughs> and, if, yeah, and if you're looking for this show it's Justin Bruckman Adventure on Facebook YouTube and all this stuff we'll have all the accounts up real soon excellent